All right, today we got a lawyer, an expert in the religious law, asking Jesus, what is the singular most important commandment in all of the Old Testament? And let's see what Jesus says because it's awesome. <laughs> Hey, Bible Time family, thanks for joining me today. This is Craig here. We are in Matthew chapter 22, verse 33. We're right in the middle of the Passion Week. This is the week between Jesus um, when he enter, enters Jerusalem and when he's crucified. And so there's actually a lot that takes place as far as how much is written uh, in the Gospel of Matthew especially. A number of chapters, like a big chunk out of the 28 chapters that are in the Gospel. And so, um, fortunately or unfortunately, it's a lot of kind of Jesus um, calling them out for quite a bit of stuff, and it's sort of coming to a head. And so, um, yeah, let's go ahead and jump in. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to grab that and the pen and, and cut that thing up with, with me right as we read. And if not, you'll see it on the, if you don't have one or you can't, you'll see it on the screen there and you'll hear it. And let's... Um, Let's just read today and remember that our primary goal is that we would grow in relationship with Jesus and affection and love for him and not just study and not just legalism and not just religion. So, yep. Alrighty. Verse 23. The same day the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies and has no children, his brother must marry his widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us, and the first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all died had her so they're actually yeah I don't know it, it's I think a lot of people basically would agree that they're not actually genuinely interested in like whose wife this person would be in heaven but more to call him out thinking that they're thinking that they're getting him on that there is no resurrection um so, yeah, I mean, who knows, really, but it says this, but when Jesus answered them, but Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So really there's two parts to this. One is that he does kind of he does actually answer the question and he teaches us that in heaven we won't be married. And so that's a might be a revelation to you, but it's it's what Jesus is saying. And then secondly, because that probably wasn't even what they're really wondering, he he uses their question, he answers it, and then he uses it to point out that there is indeed a resurrection, that there is eternal life, and that God is a God of the living, not of the dead. So this right here is one of my favorite passages. It says, so when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, so the Pharisees believe in angels, the Pharisees believe that there's a resurrection, the Sadducees don't believe in either of those two things. So they question him, trying to trap him, trying to, try, trying to get him. It says, when the Pharisees heard, they also gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, and when it says lawyer here, that would mean like an expert in the biblical law. So the way that we think about lawyers would be, you know, basically somebody that's an expert in constitutional law or, you know, whatever. Any lawyer would be, 
I guess, an expert in the whole of the law of America, but then there's specific experts, you know, in divorce law or, you know, criminal law or whatever. And so, um, in this case, lawyer would, would more likely mean somebody that's an expert in the Mosaic law and what Moses commanded of God's people in, in the Torah or the first five books of the Bible. So, so this would actually be like a Bible professor at whatever the most prestigious religious institution ever, like the highest studied Bible professor that knew it inside and out, memorized it, knew everything about theology. It'd be like that guy asking Jesus a question. He asked him, teacher, which is the singular greatest commandment in the law? So it's a, it's a good question. It's, um, I, you know, are they trying to trap him or are they genuinely saying, let's see where he's at. Let's see what he thinks. Um, but it's a, it's a actually a good question. So, so he said to him, you shall love the Lord, your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And then he says, he adds to it. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend or hang all the law and the prophets. And so notice that Jesus gives, uh, of course he's quoting here because they asked him, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So he's quoting from the law uh, from what they would understand to be the scriptures. And the first one that he is quoting is from the Shema, which is a prayer or kind of like a, a reciting that the Jewish people do every single day. And it's out of Deuteronomy 6. It's actually Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. You are to impress them upon your children. You are to talk about them when you walk along the road, when you sit at home, etc., etc. So this is a, a, a great and very important section um, that that all the Jews would have totally understood. It's super interesting that Jesus adds a second one uh, to it, and that is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which actually comes out of Leviticus. 19. I don't know the verse. Um, it's actually found in maybe more of like a random place in the Old Testament. But for Jesus, he's clearly expressing to them that that loving God with everything and loving people um, go hand in hand. That if you're going to love God, you must love people. Because all of the law, all of the prophets, all of basically what we know as the Old Testament hangs on loving God and loving people. Um, so it's really, really cool. One thing that's super interesting that, that is kind of, uh, easy to miss is this. It says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And that's what Matthew's gospel says in the original New Testament language that it was written in, which is Greek, the word is mind. But everybody understands the Hebrew out of Deuteronomy 6 to say, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And so here we have Jesus talking to a lawyer, an expert in religious law, an expert in the Old Testament scriptures. Like, think about this. The Jewish boys, by the time that they are 12, have the entire uh, Torah memorized. The first five books of the Bible memorized. And that's just a kid. And so a kid would have had it memorized word for word, what this says. And now we're talking to like the, the highest professor at Harvard who knows exactly what the scripture says and Jesus here is changing a little word. And if not Jesus, Matthew. 
So ha however Jesus said it, Matthew got the impression that there was something different there. Now Mark's account, I believe, incorporates the fourth word and it says, love, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But either way, whether you're changing a word or adding a word, that is something you do not do when it comes to scripture. And this is what Jesus is basically doing. And so I think that that begs the question, what is going on here and why would he do that? And to me, and, and this is not, this is not um, like clear exegesis, um, and so I, I'm, I'm just telling you my opinion, um, but I think that it's applicable for us devotionally. And, and so decide what you think. Let me know what you think. But for the Jewish people who had all of these laws, and by the time Jesus showed up, so Moses gave 613 commandments. By the time Jesus showed up, there was thousands upon thousands upon thousands of commandments that all the rabbis had come up with and laid on the people. Because, and, and oftentimes it was for good reasons, but we've talked about this before, but like for example, if, if the commandment is to keep the Sabbath, then hopefully well-meaning teachers would say, well, man, if we really wanna honor God, what, what exactly does he mean by that? Let's, let's make some clarifications. So, you know, if we wanna honor the Sabbath, that means we probably shouldn't walk further than X amount. That means we probably shouldn't do this type of work or if you work for this long, that means you're working and not resting. And, you know, and so it gets down to like, you, you can't even push a button in an elevator on the Sabbath. And it's what I understand like these days, even in Israel right now on, on Saturdays, all the elevators stop at every floor and they just go so you don't have to push the button because that would be work. And it's kind of like, and so isn't it clear that like, so many of the things that Jesus came to talk about and to kind of call out was this, this huge emphasis on all of these rules, all of these rules, all of these rules, all these rules. And he says to the Pharisees, like, you, you put these heavy burdens on people, but you don't lift a finger to help them. And there's just almost like this heavy burden of legalism on the people. In other words, can you make yourself right with God by your own strength, your own ability, your own, uh, I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna fulfill, I'm gonna accomplish. And I just wonder if this little change was Jesus's attempt to emphasize that he came to bring a new season, that is, a new covenant, one that is based not on legalistic righteousness, but one that's based on faith in him, faith in the mind, faith in the heart. Not just your strength and what you can accomplish, but that we would love God with all of our heart. We love God with all of our soul and we love God with all of our faith. And then I, I, I like that it's, that it's still there and included in Mark's gospel because I, I do want to love God with all of my strength, with, with all of my doing, with all of my, it's actually like the Hebrew word is like muchness. Um, but I know in my life that, that you can cross over from faith and trusting God and letting that source of life fuel your action. You can easily cross over the line to legalism and performance and doing and and me 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 by my strength doing and accomplishing and i just what i what i see in jesus's whole ministry is that he's trying to teach us that i am emmanuel i'm with you my spirit is going to fill you i am the source for your ability to accomplish it's not on you it's not by works so that no one can boast it's by grace through faith ephesians 2. So obviously that's, that's all an extrapolation from, from this text. Um, but again, I personally think that it's, it's meaningful. And at the very least, whether you agree with my conclusion, you, you, you kind of get asked, well, hey, that word is different. So why is it different? And maybe you come to your own conclusion or maybe you come to, uh, you know, you like what I said and more, I don't know. But 
the invitation is still there for you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to speak to you about it. As for me, consistently being reminded that of all of the things that I do, all the tasks, and as a pastor, you know, my life is ministry. My life is serving people and, and putting on programs and services and curriculum and small groups and all this stuff. And if I don't love God and I don't love people, I'm missing it according to Jesus. And I know that that's true, not just because he said it, but because I feel it in my, in my bones that this whole thing can become just empty and draining unless it's flowing from a place of loving God. You can follow a lot of commandments and do a lot of things and, and even produce fruit without actually loving God. And so, obviously I love this passage um, because almost every video for nine months, I have said and declared that the primary purpose of Bible time is that we would grow in our intimacy, our relationship, and our love for God. And then let that place of love and relationship convert in us into obedience to Him but it's relationship first, and then it's strength. It's relationship and then the ability to obey and walk it out. And the way that we walk that out, typically, is with other people. I mean, there's definitely things that, from beginning to end, are just between us and God, but you know as well as I know that much of life is between us and other people, and we are expressing our relationship to God to and and you know around other people and how we serve others according to Jesus is how we love him and in the two are totally connected and so how are you loving God is there anything that you love more than him is there anything that you desire more than him and how are you loving people do you hate people <laughs> are you angry with people right now are you avoiding people Good things to consider. So, to Jesus, this is the greatest two commandments. And so if it's great to Jesus and important to him, I want it to be important to me. So, that's what we got for today. I'll uh, plan on seeing you again tomorrow. May God bless you today.